you with Matt. So welcome, Matt Diver, to the RBR webinar. Uh, if you don't mind, tell us a sentence or two about your background and your area of focus. Uh, sure. So I uh, did an undergrad in physics. I took physics and, and chemistry um, in my undergrad. Then I went to Southampton to do my master's, and that's where I uh, went into physical oceanography for the first time, and I loved it. Not that I had any doubt. Um, about a month before I moved to Southampton, I actually met my girlfriend, which is now my wife. Um, so for my PhD, I actually traveled back to Canada, where I did my undergrad, uh, to do my PhD at Dalhousie University in Halifax, in Nova Scotia. And this is where I'm based now. Um, we came back here um, last August after my postdoc in Massachusetts. I went to its oceanographic institution uh, for my postdoc there, and um, and yeah. Okay. And how have you been involved in this specific project? What's been your link here? Yeah. So I'll, I'll actually talk about that um, as part of the talk, because that's that's quite of a, a big motivation about about this. But my my. Uh, my sponsor, my mentor for my postdoc, Emma Mad even. Um, she's a, a physical oceanographer at, at Hui that does a lot of biophysics interactions. And she um, was involved in that project called Calypso that's funded by the um, Office of Naval Research in the US. Um, and so I was hired for another project, but she kind of pulled me onto that project and, um, and it was awesome. Um, and I guess today is all about what we did, how we contributed. Yeah, and I think we all look forward to hearing about that. And before we begin, one last thing. Tell us one fun fact about yourself that most people, maybe even myself, don't know. Yeah, so I, uh, I try to do triathlons. And uh, on my very, very first triathlon here in Halifax, I, uh, I actually cheated and only did uh, three out of the four laps in the, the bike course. Um, which I did not realize until I was about to crash the finish line and I was thinking, wait a second, my time is way too good. <laughs> That's not possible. But I think the saddest part of that story is that I didn't even actually have the fastest time on the bikes. Some people did the entire course faster than I did <laughs> to the three quarter of it. So, yeah. Awesome. Excellent. Thank you. And without further ado, please, uh, please take it away from here. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, Eric. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining. This is this is fun. This is definitely uh, weird, giving a seminar online alone, but also seated. I think is probably the strangest part. Um, but uh, I'll I'll do my best. And so today, as Eric mentioned, this is um, work that I've done as part of my postdocs at Woods Oceanographic in the U.S. Um, and so since then, as a full disclaimer. I guess I didn't put it anywhere on that slide, but since then, in January, I actually started as a research scientist at RBR. So I, I'm now um, part of the team at RBR, which is really exciting. And this is actually, this project is, is how my relationship with RBR started. So it, it's, it's related in some ways. So this is work I've done over the last two and a half years, um, obviously with a lot of uh, colleagues and support. So Amalama Adeven was, um, my mentor and um, at Uzo Oceanographic, but I got a lot of help from different PIs and physical oceanographers, including Mar Frelick. Uh, she's a PhD student at, at Hui that helped a lot, and you can see her in the picture frowning. I think her uh, <clears throat> digestive system wasn't doing great on, on that cruise. Um, but here you can see where the Eco CTD is. So it's that thing dangling at the end of the line, and I'll go more in details about that. And, and today is, is all about this. Um, also, if that picture could talk, actually, uh, you would you would hear the, the talkie walkie. Is, uh, <coughs> the walkie talkie is about, is about to say, um, please, "Please don't lean over the rail that far." Um, the first mate was not was not very impressed. I'm being muted for some reason. I think this is good now, right? Um, so all of this is uh, work that has been recently published in a paper in JTEC that you have the reference here for people that want to revisit. So um, I'll, I'll start by presenting the EcoCTD quickly and then we'll get back to it a bit later, but just to make sure we're all on the same page and you know what I'm talking about. 
Um, so the ecocity is that is that thing that basically it's really just a mechanical design that we came up with that integrates different kind of sensors um, and that profiles in the ocean. So I'll, I'll go in details all over um, all of this, but it's about um, a meter high, a bit short of a meter high, and it's about 10 centimeters in diameter. It's on the heavy side, it, it weighs about 13 kilogram um, in, in air. And so it, it, it basically is composed of a CTD, which you can see here, which is an RBR CTD, and, and we'll get back to it. But there's also an oxygen sensor sticking out on the side here that you see, and then the, that, that black puck is a wet lab echo puck that um, measures fluorescence, um, i.e. chlorophyll, but also backscatter. And, and we'll, we'll go back to the design more um, in detail. But so in the film, going back to that picture, you can see here the hole for the ecopack. There's actually no ecopack on that picture because we're doing some testing and the ecopack is expensive to lose. So uh, you can see the oxygen sensor sticking out the side, the CTD facing down. And those, those big things here are, are lead colors and those add weight to the probe for uh, some reasons that would become uh, obvious later on in, in the talk. Um, including making sure that that probe actually falls vertically um, and straight vertically through the water column and not at an angle that would uh, mess up with the dynamics. So all of this system relies on that, on that picture. You can see that it relies on a winch um, that I won't talk about today at all because this is not part of the work that I've done. We've used uh, an underway CTD winch, which is a fairly well-established uh, instrument, the underway CTD that was developed at Scripps um, about 15 years ago. Um, and I'll go over the differences between the two systems that um, one of the objectives that we had was to develop an instrument that could be adapted directly onto that system that a lot of PIs already have um, but and have available so that avoids having to create a new winch or new systems. Okay, so why the ECOCTD? And I think this is um, the best way of, of understanding um, why we, we came up with that thing. And so uh, bear with me a little, because that, that's the sciencey part of the, of the talk, but that's really to address some specific objectives, science objectives. And so, and I guess that's the best way of, of developing new instruments, right? You come up with a question and then you just come up with a tool that helps you uh, reach that, um, that hypothesis and, and test it. And so that's part of the Calypso project that uh, is funded by the Office of Naval Research that I'm still involved in um, with a bunch of, of um, teams all over the world, actually, the Spanish collaborators as well. Uh, it's a really good program. And um, one of the key objectives of that program is to provide some observational evidence of how water is transported from the top layer of the ocean uh, in the mixed layer to below the mixed layer depth uh, in the ocean interior. So this, this connectivity between those two layers of the ocean, and we're not really sure how those two things happen in vertical, right? It's really hard to exchange water in the vertical in the ocean most of the movement is horizontal. So one of the hypotheses um, that we wanted to test it, and now I'll, I'll go in detail on what those words mean, but um, is the, the fact that submesoscale instabilities, and I'll go over what that means in a second, um, can actually generate vertical velocities and exchange water between those two, those two layers. Um, and so what are submesoscale instabilities? Um, so in the ocean, we're fairly, um, Acquainted with mesoscale motion, this is usually what you see from satellites. So on the right here, you can see a picture of the Gulf Stream and you see big 80s that sheds off that current. Um, you can see a big 80 in the Gulf of Mexico here. Those are fairly large um, oceanic features that spans thousands of kilometers and that slowly evolving over days to months. So they, they're, fairly, um, they're fairly steady in time. And those are associated with very very weak vertical velocities. And this is actually what we uh, all learn in intro PO, intro physical oceanography, is that generally speaking, vertical velocities in the ocean are fairly weak, which explains why there's so little exchange between the, in the vertical um, in the ocean. On the other end of the spectrum, you have turbulent motions that evolve very, very quickly at very small scale, order of a centimeter. And in that case, you actually have isotropy, which means that um, the current velocity is basically the same in wherever direction you're looking into. So w has the same order of magnitude as horizontal velocities. And so in the middle of that, you get this transitional regime that connects those two ends of the spectrum that is called submesoscale motions. And that has become a very popular topic in physical oceanography. Now more and more publications are about those dynamics. And that's because 
we're slowly improving our ways of observing the ocean and we're actually starting to both model and observe those motions that we, don't, we didn't really know anything about before. And so those, those uh, range of motions occur over time scales of hours to days, so they're, they're fairly rapidly evolving. And they also have horizontal resolutions of about hundreds of meters to um, tens of kilometers. And those were actually modeled and, and proven to be associated with very strong or relatively strong vertical velocities. And so there's this big hypothesis is like, okay, maybe those scales is what is actually changing, exchanging water between the top layer and the ocean interior. Um, so to visualize some of this motion and, and kind of put an image in your mind on, um, for that term, this is a picture of a bloom in the Baltic Sea um, that you can find on the NASA website. That's a picture that you likely have seen before. It's incredible. But here you can see the scale is about 10 kilometers and you can see all kind of features in there, 80s and filaments and you can see an airplane track here. And so if you zoom on that white square and you go to a scale about a kilometer, that's about that large, you can see the track of a ship. And then you can see that these features uh, that are about the size of a kilometer everywhere, they, they all over the place. And, and those are really hard to capture and, and resolve and understand the dynamics. And so as I, as I said, they're associated with very specific spatial temporal scales. And the problem with that is that they're really awkward to measure, to observe. And that's why uh, this is um, one field of oceanography where modeling is actually ahead of observations because it's easier to model those scales than to actually observe them. And so for example, for satellites, the, their resolution is only starting to reach those scales. Um, it's otherwise too coarse to actually capture those land scales. And it's also, those features are also too fast for satellites. By the time the satellite comes around and visits the same place, the field has completely changed because the, the repeating time is way too long. But they're also too big and too fast for ship CTDs, right? Those CTDs uh, from a, a ship are very time consuming. You stop, you uh, deploy the CTD, you sample for two hours, three hours, six hours, if you go really deep. Um, by the time you come back, you move to the next station and you sample again, the field has changed. You, it takes hours and hours, sometimes days, and you don't cover a lot of ground uh, over that time scale. So that, that's, that's uh, definitely a challenge. But one really cool thing about that, those scales is that those physical scales of hundreds of meters to a kilometer and hours to days actually overlap with the biological scales and what we know about it. So we came up with this this idea, we're like, well, maybe a good way to visualize those pathways where the water is sent from the upper layer of the ocean downward is to use biological tracers, because now that water mass actually is being subducted fast enough that bi the biology footprint of that water mass is not changing very much. Um, so it would be really cool to be able to couple physics and biology and, and maybe have a good idea of what, what's happening at those scales. And so that, that's kind of what stemmed the entire idea of the ECOCTD really. So what we needed, and this is the list of, of checkbox that we came up with. So we need something that could profile about 500 meters deep um, where most of the biology is happening um, and could provide vertical profiles at a sub-kilometer lateral resolution. So profile fast enough that you could have uh, profiles very close together. But we also wanted something uh, we wanted it to have very little impact on other science. So on those projects, on those crews, you have you know, 15, 20 PIs that are all trying to do their science. Everyone is competing for ship time. That's really expensive and hard to get. But one thing on cruises that is way, way underused is when the ship is steaming, right? It's actually doing this most of the time, but not much science is, is happening during those times. So we wanted to leverage that kind of wasted time towards actually collecting data and doing science. Um, so something that we could be used underway would be, would be great for that. And because of that, we also wanted something that is also versatile in a way that it's really easy to deploy and recover. You know, if you start going around and tell other PI, well, I have this really cool instrument, but it took, it's going to take two hours to deploy and two hours to recover, then yeah, people start frowning. They don't, they, you're not very popular on the ship at that point. Um, so obviously we're using science money. So, you know, the cheaper, the better, which is, pretty obvious, but most importantly, as I mentioned before, we wanted it to um, also to couple physics and bio-optical properties. So we really wanted oxygen, we really wanted chlorophyll fluorescence and backscatter um, to be able to um, 
couple those two sets of data sets. So we didn't invent anything. Obviously, uh, some of those platforms already exist and have been developed for uh, many years by different companies. And really, they can be classified into two broader categories. The first one being toad bodies. Um, so you can see three of them um, at the top here, the Traxxas, the Seesaw, and the Scanfish. And those um, generally uses a big winch, a big cable, a big crane to deploy them, and then you kind of drag them at the back of the ship while you're underway, and you have a wing system that kind of makes them undulate through the water column. Um, those are great. Uh, the only problem with those is that they're generally very expensive because they're a big piece of equipment. Um, but you can stick a lot of sensors on those. The payload is, is huge, so it's, it's pretty convenient. But um, it's pretty cumbersome to deploy and recover, and you need a winch operator, and so that, that's not very um, what we had in mind. On the other end of the spectrum, you get those vertical profilers, which are very lightweight. And um, the picture in the middle here is the UCTD, the underwear CTD that I mentioned before. Um, and that was... Um, very uh, helpful. It's been wildly used in the field of physical oceanography. It's very light. It's about, uh, I think it's about six kilograms. Yeah, that's right here. Six kilograms, torpedo shaped, and, um, and that's what you do. You just drop it in the water column, it goes straight down, and then you really back, and then it goes straight down. And that was just basically a step up from um, the XBGs, the Expendables Bathy Thermograph, I think is what it stands for, which were expendable probes that would measure temperature but then you would let them sink. And I think about 15 years ago, Dan Rednick and his uh, lab kind of came up with the idea, well, if we tether it to the ship and we bring it back every time, maybe we don't have to buy so many of them. Um, so that's what they did. And, um, and that's been used quite extensively in our field. But it only measured uh, temperature and conductivity and pressure. Um, and so we wanted to kind of take another step forward from that probe and add and tag on some uh, bioptical properties on there. Um, Velport actually came up with a probe that looks very similar to the UCTD that has a fluorometer as an option on there. That's a fairly new product. I don't know much about it, um, but I know it, it actually includes also a, a fluorometer in, in, on top of their CTD here. So that's what we came up with. That was the result of that brainstorming, something that would check all the boxes that we wanted. Um, and so we built it around the RBR Concerto CTD. Um, that has two external ports on the side. So here you can see the cable come out. And, and that's, that's basically how my relationship with RBR started is that product for us was um, ideal for many different reasons. Um, the first one is the, the shape of it, the form factor was very attractive, long and skinny, because we don't want something that's too fat, otherwise the form drag is too important for profiling. Um, you could sample at high frequency, and it also, but mostly, it also acts as a logger. And, and that was uh, really key for us because this way, every single data is logged onto the same timestamp. And that's a massive, massive time saver when it comes to data processing. I'm sure anyone that does observational oceanography knows matching timestamps is always a headache. And, and so that, that's great, because now the all bio-optical and CTB observations are all mapped onto the same time axis, so it's very, very convenient. And lastly, the Concerto actually runs on AA batteries, um, which is, uh, this, this is so great when you have to ship things around the world, AA batteries like, you can find them everywhere, right? If your container doesn't show up, that which happened on our last cruise, um, it's fairly simple to replace them. You don't have to worry about lithium if you don't want to. Um, and so that's great. So we, we kind of use the RBR Concerto as, a, as the brain of the EcoCTD. And for the bio-optics, we use two different kind of oxygen sensors. Uh, the Winko, which is from GFE Adventec, a Japanese product. Uh, which is actually depicted on that on that uh, design here. We also uh, use the RBR audio that uh, has the same response time, and that's really what's important for us because we're profiling vertically at high speeds. We need something that responds quickly, which is always a bit of a challenge with oxygen sensors. And then the wet lab eco pack that has, um, as I mentioned, fluorescence and and backscatter on it. And so that's how this whole thing is arranged. The cable runs into uh, some ways um, amongst the clamp, and that's all of this is within the uh, aluminum housing. And so those two colors here that you see in light yellow, um, those actually contain 
lead shots in there that are um, um, embedded in epoxy. And this is to increase the weight of the probe for um, two reasons. The first one is to make sure that it falls straight vertically, as I mentioned before. Uh, but the other thing is to ensure that the probe is actually heavy enough because if it's too light, as it's profiling, the line drag of the line holding the probe actually becomes important and your probe slows down with depth as more and more line is being dragged through the water. Um, and so if your probe is heavy enough, the ratio of the line drag to um, the free falling velocity of the, of the probe is larger and so you don't have to worry about line drag as much. And so that's why we made it a bit on the heavier side, heavy, light enough that it can be handled by one person, but heavier that we can ensure a, a relatively high uh, fall rate and profiling speed. And so conceptually, this is how we wanted to use it. You at the back of the ship, you throw it overboard and you release it. You let it free fall. It free falls perfectly vertically and straight down. And then you activate the brake on the winch and then you start the winch and then you slowly reel it back to the ship. And then by the time um, it's back to the ship, you release it again. And so the idea for the EcoCTD would, depending on the depth, that you go into, obviously, um, the, to 500 meters, the whole cycle would take about 12 minutes. Um, so depending on ship speed, you can adjust then and pick the horizontal resolution that you would have, the separation that you would have between those two profiles here. Um, and so I guess the first step in all of this was to check that the probe was actually doing what we wanted to. Um, and so here you can see uh, an example of a profile on the top panel, it's pressure versus time. And on the bottom panel, it's the rate of change of pressure versus time. So the, the velocity um, in the vertical of the probe. And so you can see that here it's, it's released um, and allowed to free fall and kind of falls all the way to 250 meters, which seems that the slope is relatively constant. Um, and so that ensures, you can see it in, in the DPDT, that the fall rate is between three and four meters per second in the vertical, which is good because we wanted a high falling rate to make sure that the inductive cell of the CTD was flushed properly and continuously. Um, so we don't want the, the probe to be moving through the water too slowly. Um, and you can see that the line drag still has a, a bit of an impact on, on the fall rate. Um, as the probe gets deeper and deeper, the fall rate slows down, which was expected. And so here we activate the brake. And so the fall rate becomes negative. And you can see that, that up and down when the probe is being reeled back to the ship. And that's actually the heaving of the ship. So every time the ship goes up, it pulls on the line and the, the entire probe accelerates. And then the ship goes down and the probe kind of slows down. And so you can see the ship heaving in that, in that time series quite well. And so that kind of worried us because um, when the probe is, is, is profiling vertically, you really want it to be free falling. You don't want it to be coupled to the ship. I mean, people spend thousands and thousands and thousands of, do of dollars on, on um, heave compensation systems for CTDs, right? Because it's, it's, um, it's not great to have something that's attached to the ship with a, a variable fall rate and sometimes looping around. And, and so that, that actually makes processing a lot easier. So we started to think, okay, well, we want to check whether or not that probe is actually decoupled from the ship. Um, and how do we do that? So I actually um, put in a proposal a way to get some time on the Armstrong. Uh, which uh, was successful and pretty exciting. So we went and tested further the, uh, in the EcoCTD. And what, what we did is that we set uh, an IMU, an inner motion unit on both the, so we duct taped it on top of the, of the ship's deck on the A-frame. And then we, we stuffed one in the EcoCTD um, and those measure acceleration. So the idea was to see if they both co-vary, then that means the probe is accelerating and decelerating in phase or out of phase with the ship, it doesn't really matter. And, um, and that would be a problem. That would mean that they, they've still coupled and um, we'll have to be really careful about that when we process the data. Um, and so we did that on a stormy day in um, the North Atlantic in November on the Armstrong, which for anyone that has been on the Armstrong, it um, rolls quite a bit. And that's actually the picture you've seen uh, as part of the, the title slide. And so here you can see the, the time series of the vertical acceleration measures by, measured by the two units. So in red is the deck unit, the one on the ship. And you can very well see the heaving of the ship going up and down. You can measure the acceleration and at um, a period that uh, lands between eight and 10 seconds. You can see that peak here in the spectra 
between eight and 10 seconds period, you get a lot of power spectral density or a lot of variance uh, in that range. And that's because the ship is going up and down all the time with the waves, um, which took out two of the PhD students with us. Um, if you look at the probe unit, the, the uh, accelerometer that was on the probe, so you can see the initial phase where the, the probe is accelerating through the water. And then at third point, the, the vertical acceleration becomes zero, which means that it's, it's falling at a constant rate. Um, so, and it's, it seems to be free falling because you don't see any of that, of that um, variability in the signal that you see in the ship one. And actually, if you look at the spectra, you don't even have a peak between eight and 10 seconds in the variance. And that's great. That, that means that the probe is actually free falling. So we, we were extremely excited about this. That, um, and and th that means the data quality is, is significantly improved. Uh, and so in terms of temporal and uh, spatial resolution, um, so we, it obviously depends on the profile depth, so how deep you go and how fast you go, right? Because by the time you, the fastest the ship is moving, um, the further away you are from the previous profile by the time you do the entire cycle. Um, and so you can achieve sub-kilometer resolution here on the, on the plot on the right-hand side. The contours are the spacing in meters and the, as a function of the ship speed and the profile depth. So for Calypso, for example, we were mostly going in the upper 300 uh, meters, and we tend to stay between four and five knots to make sure that we would stay under a kilometer lateral resolution. If you're not that worry about the kilometer, you can um, sacrifice a bit of the horizontal resolution and go faster, um, which usually makes people on the ship uh, happier because you're going to where you're going faster. Um, and so, and that's actually a big advantage compared to um, the UCTD, and that's what it, I mean here by the quick profile turnover. The, the UCTD, the underway CTD, had to be, uh, to free fall, it had, you had to spool line at the back of it. And so you had to put it back on deck, spool line on the tail spool, and redeploy it. And that would make the temporal resolution very long, which means that the lateral resolution would suffer from it. But because the eco CG is heavier, you don't need to do that. You bring it back to the ship, and by the time you see it show up at the surface, boom, you release it again, and you don't have to bring it back up and then um, redeploy it. So that, that, saves, that saves a lot of time. And also, when seas are rough, you know, the deployment and recovery is, is the sketchy part. Um, once it's in the water, you don't have to worry about it as much. So it's great to not have to bring it up and down. So um, Sampling uh, at high speed, uh, for profiling at higher speed between three and four meters per second uh, introduces a whole set of challenges in new data. And that's something that I've um, learned about a lot through my postdoc. And I'm actually now actually using as part of my um, position at RBR. But uh, um, the, the paper also includes quite a, a bit of recommendation on how to process data when you're sampling at that speed. Uh, one of the, the largest dynamic error to consider is aligning temperature and conductivity properly. So those two um, measurements have different response time. The temperature actually takes longer to respond than the conductivity. Conductivity is an um, electric uh, measurement, observation, so it's for all intents and purposes instantaneous compared to temperature. And so this, this little animation here that um, a colleague of mine made actually shows what happens. So if, if your temperature and your conductivity are not perfectly aligned in the vertical, um, you actually end up with salinity spiking. And that, that's something that has been recognized um, a lot in the literature and in the field, that when, if you compute salinity from temperature and conductivity and they're not properly aligned, you end up with those spurious data in the salinity that contaminates your, your data set. And that, that's, quite, that's quite a problem. And there's been a lot of of papers written about how to uh, correct for that and um, as a function of fall rate as well. Um, and so we, we tackle all of this and uh, um, we actually managed to correct the data quite well. So here you can see a profile of conductivity and temperature and salinity on the right. And so the black line is the raw data. And because conductivity and temperature are not perfectly aligned, you end up with a, a, a peak in salinity that's not real, that's not actually um, there. And so after correcting conductivity and shifting it, shifting the time series to match the temperature and the conductivity um, together, then you, have, you can actually drastically reduce um, the salinity spiking. So um, another step to make your data uh, much more, um, you know, higher quality data. And so we actually took it on the field a few times 
to uh, test it out um, twice actually. And so as part of the Calypso um, cruise, so in 2018 and 2019, we went in that part of the world, which is not a bad place to do oceanography most of the time. Um, so this is the Western Mediterranean, as you can see, south of Spain. Uh, Morocco is here and Algeria is here on the, on the bottom right. And that, that place is very uh, interesting for our science objectives because that's where the inflow of uh, cold and um, fresher water coming from the Atlantic through the Strait of Gibraltar um, come in contact with the Mediterranean water that's very warm and very salty. So you end up with a very, very sharp density gradient between those two water masses, and that's where some mesoscale motions are expected to be um, very active. And so we went into that part of the world and decided to start processing and to start sampling. And so here, what I'm, what I'm showing, just to, so you have an idea of the, of the kind of data that we collect with that probe, um, this is an example of a transect through that, um, for that mission in the Western Mediterranean. And so here on the left-hand side, you see the temperature and salinity plot. And so basically, we did a transect across the front. And you can clearly see that we're sampling two different water masses with two different salinity signatures, right? Um, so here, the western part is saltier than the eastern part. And so as we cross it, you change water masses. And you can see it in the, in the transect of temperature and salinity here. You can see the very warm um, temperature here that's associated with uh, fresher water. And you can see the density from so outcropping around here and then you can see the, the denser side of the front kind of being subducted down underneath the lighter water on the right hand side of the plot. And so to actually visualize water being subducted from the upper layer of the ocean downward um, and you can kind of see it in the temperature. You can see a, a bit of a warm anomaly here that's along that isopic now between 27.5 and 28. But it's actually not easy to detect. And so that's when this whole thing of, of you know, using bio-optical data uh, to confirm it comes um, into play. And so here is what we get from um, the uh, bio-optical sensors. And so here on the left-hand side, you can see chlorophyll with the deep chlorophyll maximum being at two different depths, actually, uh, two different isopic nodes, depending on the water mass, you can see very clearly that this side is actually deeper than this side, which is kind of cool. And you can kind of see some uh, darker colors here. You have to look pretty closely or uh, take my word for it, but it's not that obvious. Um, you see a similar increase of oxygen uh, where the temperature is a bit warmer. And so maybe there's some trace of subduction, but it's not obvious, but it's when it comes to backscatter that you realize that there is actually a very large uh, subduction event uh, happening with water being subducted from um, the heavier side of the front underneath and deep down. And, and here you about 150 meters deep, you build a mixed layer, which means this thing is not coming back up because the, the, even the winter mixed layer is not as deep in that part of the world. So whatever is gonna be sent down, um, is actually ventilating the ocean interior. And so this is how we visualize the pathway that the water was taking, which was very exciting for us. The reason why it, it shows up in backscatter and not so much in chlorophyll and oxygen is because uh, we suspect anyway, this is um, a theory that we have, is that most of the material that's being affected with the water mass is actually uh, not fluorescing anymore. So either it's dead, either it's non-organic material, uh, that's being advicted down. So we see it in backscatter, but we don't see it very much in the chlorophyll. And this is actually something that we're hoping to be doing very soon is looking at the gradient of oxygen and chlorophyll within that, that kind of tongue of water. Um, you can have ideas of timescales if you know how fast biology is changing, then taking the difference in concentration between the tip and the beginning of it, you can, you can infer how long it would take for that water to go down. Um, which is something that's very exciting, but definitely not trivia to do. Um, very, very challenging, a lot of different issues, uh, but we're getting there. It's actually, it's actually pretty exciting. Um, and so to summarize, um, so the, what the EcoCTD is all about is really just coupling biophysical observations. And that's what's cool. And that's why we had issues finding something that would do what we want to do is really to have concurrent observations of uh, physics and biology together to use an interdisciplinary approach to actually address our uh, hypothesis. Um, and so we managed to reach resolution there um, sub-kilometer, which is great because you can also cover a lot of, of um, 
a lot of distance while keeping that resolution, right? You could sample every every 100 meters with a CTG rosette, but by the time you were a kilometer away, it would be a week later. Um, so you can cover a lot of ground at high resolution, which is great. Um, and it's also, uh, what we like about it is that it's, it's highly customizable. So you can change the channel, the optical channels that you want, if you want. Um, we also have an ecocity that has a uh, Boda mine uh, as a channel, and that would be very useful for um, dye tracing experiments, for example. When you release dye, it's really hard to uh, know where it goes. You have to take samples and or use a fluorometer. That usually only is a flow through system, so you only get the surface. But here you would actually be able to map in 3D what the dye um, diffusion is like. Um, and so that's something we actually plan on using, hopefully in the future, and we're pretty excited about. Um, and so we, we managed to demonstrate that the, the, the quality of the data remained really high, even, even though um, we, don't, um, we don't use the same methodology as for the underway CTD, and that's because we tweaked a, a little things in the design to do it. Um, but that doesn't remove the need for important dynamic corrections, and that, that's something that I can't stress enough, that the, there's a lot of post-processing to be done to uh, make the data, uh, you know, science-worthy. Um, and so you can also um, tweak a lot of the, the different characteristics to achieve what you want. If you want to follow it faster or uh, slower, you can adjust the weight in the red colors by putting a bit less or more weight. You can change the sensors. Some people want um, asked us to put a tropidity center sensor instead of an, up, an updode. Um, I've had some chats about trying to integrate all kind of different sensors. Um, the only really requirement is that it, it res the response time is fast enough. Otherwise, um, it, it's useless. You're just having a very smooth profile and it's not, it's not very instructive. Um, and so, yeah, and so the instrument can be using other, um, all kind of applications, which is kind of cool. So we're still working on this. This is something that, you know, this is something we build one at a time. We have, we have five now, I think, um, for different projects that we are, actually, we only have four because one of them is sitting at the bottom of the Mediterranean, unfortunately, and that would explain my next slide. Uh, but um, we're working towards in, in enhancing modulability. So instead of having two tubes of aluminum that are attached together, is having a, a, a tube that would fit each instrument. And this way, you're really just removing whatever instrument you want to put, and then you attach kind of Legos looking uh, tubes. You just attach them together and then plug it into the concerto. As long as the sensor is integrated, then you can uh, decide what configuration you have. And that would be quite um, attractive to us because the, so the, eco, the eco puck is, is an expensive piece of equipment and sometimes it's not needed. And it's kind of a shame to take the risk of losing it if, if, you, don't, if you don't want it. Um, another thing that we want to add on it is uh, stemmed from the event where we lost one. Um, the line just suddenly became loose and we have no idea what happened to it. There's all kind of theories on the ship. Um, but the fact that we were doing a transect through our own surface drifter, I think played a pretty large role in that. Um, but we are trying to come up with an emergency recovery system. So basically something uh, kind of a bladder that would inflate um, when you reach a critical depth um, and would come back to the surface with a, a GPS on it. Um, a little tracker that would help us, um, you know, recover that probe because the, the whole, the XBTs were really cheap because they were disposable. The UCTD was a bit more expensive, but it was still cheap. So losing one wasn't the end of the world, but we're starting to reach prices where when you lose one, it becomes a bit, you know, harder to find more funding to replace. So um, not losing them would be so much better. And I think this is all I have. So yeah, this is a picture taken from uh, the Port Quapa, actually, in, in the Mediterranean Sea. And uh, yeah, not a bad place to do oceanography. So I'll take any questions if, if you have any. Thank you, Matt. That was, that was really great to hear the presentation, see all your nice data, a few nice photos. And um, Candace and I have been working hard to try to address some people's questions during the presentation. We've addressed some of them. Um, of which I want you to provide some feedback and some that we wanted to save specifically for you. So um, I'm going to actually just start from the beginning, so where we had some of the questions. Uh, one of them was about how the guard and the, the metal housing itself affects the conductivity measurement because of um, the inductive conductivity cell and proximity. I did explain through the chat session that the guard is a standard product and we calibrate the conductivity cell with the guard on. 
and it can protect from bumps against the bottom as long as the bumps aren't too hard and the bottom is fairly soft. Um, but would you like to talk about your experience or your thoughts about how the metal cylinder will affect the conductivity? I think you were going to do a cal at the at RBR. Yeah. I can't remember what happened with that. So the, the, the unit is a bit too big, I think, for the calibration tank at RBR. Um, so we actually made a mistake that I, um, I'll gladly share. This when no one can repeat it. We actually ordered the CTD without the guard first, and then realized it was an absolute stupid idea, and ordered the guard afterwards, which means the calibration wasn't with the guard, um, and we had it recalibrated really since then. So that's okay. But um, the guard is actually uh, a really good idea because it gives you a way to rest the instrument without, you know using the CG cell <laughs> as, a, as a foot. Um, and so in terms of the aluminum, it, uh, the tubing, the housing probably makes a, quite a difference, yes. And that's why we actually complete uh, cross calibration casts before. So at the beginning, the first and the last cast of any of the crews we do, we strap the Eco CTD onto the rosette um, 20 centimeters away from everything to make sure there's no further contamination from the frame. And then we do a uh, careful cross-validation cross to make sure that the, the connectivity readings uh, make sense. And, and we've been pretty successful at that. We, we've had a, we, we managed to demonstrate that it works pretty well. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question was about um, deployment depth versus fall rate and ship speed. And um, the person's contacted that uh, they've used a UCTD and it's, uh, it's hard to know exactly how deep it goes just based on the stopwatch. And if you're trying to get past a mixed layer or past a certain depth, um, it can be a little tricky. So just what was your experience with that? And um, you'd mentioned the depth rating of four or 500 meters. What's that dependent upon? And can it be extended deeper? Yeah, uh, happily. So if you remember, the limiting factor for us is the echo puck, which is uh, rated to 600 meters now, I think. And we have an older version of the echo puck that's 500. And that's the only reason why it's rated to 500. It could go deeper if the echo puck wasn't on it or was rated to a higher depth. The advantage of the echo CTD that's heavier and you can actually go deeper, that's not, that's not a problem. And you, you won't suffer like the UCTD when you go too deep, the fall rate becomes too weak. And so it takes a very long time to, so the first 200 meters go fast, but the last 100 meters when you go to 1,000 meter, for example, take a much longer time. Uh, that's not quite the case with the CTD. The fall rate varies between four and three, um, as opposed to four and one for, for the UCTD. So, um, but indeed the system is the same, you're timing and, and you rely on an average fall rate and you count 90 seconds and then you stop it. And sometimes you leave the first year PhD student with it and <laughs> you get really, really close to the 500 meter <laughs> pressure rating. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's, yeah, there's still no way of really knowing except that the full rate is a bit more consistent, so it's a bit more predictable. Do you have a number in your head about how accurate it is? If you are aiming for 400 meters, do you get plus or minus 1%, 10%, what kind of um, I'd say, I'd say, yeah, 10%. Okay. Yeah. Uh, depends how close the bottom is and what kind of material it is based on whether you air or shallow or deep, I suppose. Yeah. Um, another good question is about the backscatter measurement and um, its, um, its response to temperature and salinity affecting the seawater backscattering itself and how that um, relates to particles as well. This is from an optical expert, as you can tell. Yeah, those, not an easy those, question. Are, those are good, good questions. Um, so I learned a lot about optical measurements over the last three years. Um, and so you'll notice that the plots that I've shown are all in counts, which are engineering units and, and doesn't really, is not a unit of backscatter per se. Um, a lot of what we do is uh, relative backscattering and, and having different water masses would definitely affect um, the backscattering of the seawater. Um, we use, this is, this is a hard one. I would encourage to send me an email so I have time to think about it, but we definitely use a correction for temperature and salinity to get the, the, the theoretical backscatter of, of the seawater and remove that from the signal. Um, so when we do our analysis, that, that's what we haven't gone as far as associating the backscatter to actually organic matter concentration, because that's a leap that's hard to do. Um, but we do remove the effect of, of the seawater. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, next question is shallower water. Have you had experience using it in 10 to 50 meters of water and, and how that works and what the caveats are concerns? No, we haven't. Um, 
but it was actually thought so we could. So we haven't yet, but the, the, the dye tracing experiment that I mentioned idea would have been around Mathos Vineyard, which is relatively shallow. Um, and that's why the, the lead colors, if you notice, are actually two colors. And you can, so you can easily have only just one of them. And this way you reduce the flow rate, this way you don't have to, you know, one second is not an extra five meter um, on your profile. So it's easier to fine tune and have more confidence that you're not gonna hit the bottom. Um, but the short answer is no, we haven't, we haven't used it in, in shallow water. But if so, I would recommend having either no lead colors, either just one lead color, um, to slow the probe down. This way you increase your vertical uh, resolution in your data and you get a bit more leeway room before you hit the bottom. Okay. Um, sample rate. Some people were asking you to repeat what sample rate you were going and I suppose the follow-up question to that is, um, is there value to sampling faster if you needed to? So um, our sampling rate is 8 hertz. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure it's 8 hertz. <laughs> um, and the reason why it's 8 hertz, uh, going faster would be great. I always say you should go as fast as you can. Um, but that's 8 hertz is importantly how fast we can because of uh, the limitations on the bio-optical sensors. They don't, they don't sample um, at much higher rate than that. It's that that's the limiting factor. The, the CTD could, could sample much faster, but not with the bio-optics attached to it. Okay. Great, and just for the people listening, the RBR CTD um, with CTD alone will sample at 32 hertz. Once you start adding a couple sensors on, it goes to 16 hertz. If you add more sensors, it goes to eight hertz. Um, so it depends a little bit on the combination of, of how many channels the CTD is logging. Um, but as, as Matt said, sometimes the optical sensors themselves have an inherent sample rate maximum. Um, okay, the only other question we had was about whether the data from the MED is publicly available. <laughs> That's an excellent question. I believe it is. I believe, I, okay. I believe it is. Yeah. So, so um, write to Matt directly for that. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Because it hasn't been published yet, it's not in a on a public repository, but it will. Um, but I'm, I'm, I don't think there's any restriction on sharing it. So, um, yeah. Okay. So, so you can reach Matt. Yeah. Um, yeah. His his email address is at on the first slide, which will be in this webinar. Um, okay. I'm gonna stop speaking myself and I'm going to, uh, people should be able, allowed to unmute themselves uh, if they wanna have a d direct discussion or question with Matt. Um, otherwise, I'll stand by here. If people write in questions, I'll certainly, um, I'll certainly address them and, uh, and Matt can, can join. But what mm -hmm. I'm going to do is stop the recording. So everyone, thanks, thanks for joining, and, uh, but we're gonna stick on the line here.